we know that by 1865, the North has won the war. And one reason why they win is that they have 21 million people and the South has 9 million people. But that's not always what determines victory in a war. Another reason is that eventually the federal government commits itself to a policy of emancipating slaves. And this makes the Southern economy crumble from within. And eventually 200,000 African Americans will serve in the Union Army. So that's part of the margin of victory as well. As president, Abraham Lincoln makes key decisions that are also part of the margin of victory. He's a great president. But another thing that is absolutely crucial is the way that the federal government is able to manage massive quantities of industrial production that equip an army that is larger than any army, certainly the, the U.S. has ever seen, and probably larger than any army that had actually fought in a war before. The Union ultimately fields an army of two million men. That's a huge army, and two million men require a huge amount of equipment. The war required, in fact, one billion rounds of ammunition, one million horses and mules, 1.5 million barrels of pork, 100 million pounds of cotton, 6 million woolen blankets, 6 million pairs of trousers. There had never in history been an effort to equip this many men with this many things. So how did the Union Army and how did the Union government do it? In fact, the conflict will ultimately cost over $13 billion. Now put that in context by remembering that at the start of the war, the entire country's wealth amounted to only about $12 billion, about one third of which was in fact slaves. So the US economy in effect invested its entire wealth, uh, all of the wealth it had in paying for this massive war. So how did the federal government do it? It did it by borrowing from the future, by selling bonds, and it also did it by printing money. It printed so much money, in fact, that inflation increases dramatically and started to eat away at the wages of the workers who were producing all these new war goods. Even as their wages rose, inflation rose even faster, so that the value of their daily wage dropped by 30% during the course of the war. We can see that as a cost that's paid even by those who don't go and fight in the war. And the war, of course, also cost 626,000 lives, maybe more according to some recent estimates. And that's a tremendous cost as well. That many people, uh, especially that many people in the prime of their life, those kinds of losses produce a tremendous impact on the economy. And over time, that would continue to be felt. Uh, it would even be felt in the number of men who have to live the rest of their lives missing limbs or uh, suffering from other kinds of horrific impacts from the war. In the 1890s and early 1900s, uh, the highest expense of the Mississippi state government, for instance, would be the expense of supplying and repairing artificial limbs for legless or armless Confederate war veterans. Along with the bonds and the greenbacks, the government had also implemented new taxes, including the nation's first income tax. But despite all of these efforts, the debt at the end of the war for the Union, for the United States federal government, was still almost $3 billion, which was huge in 1865 terms. And of course, the Confederate states and the Confederate debt had run up a huge debt as well. The Confederate government didn't exist anymore, but the states still did and they would try to pay off their debt uh, over the next 30 or 40 years. In contrast to the 1840s, they would see this as a moral obligation. So was the Civil War an actual revolution? Was it the second American Revolution? I've given you all of these figures, but we still have to circle back to the biggest single impact, and that is the emancipation of four million enslaved African Americans. That alone makes the Civil War a true revolution. 
let's move forward and we'll look at what that emancipation actually meant.